not going to be here. Christina. Jason. Anthony Sedaris. Emily St. Pierre. Brian. Carl. Lauren. Shannon. Tangben. And Aaliyah. There you go. Hey, uh, Carl, did you talk to your group? Not yet. Not yet? Okay. All right. Okay. Welcome back, folks. It's good to see you. I hope you all had a good Halloween. Appreciate your patience with me last week. Um, you know, family and I had a good time trick-or-treating. So, did anyone do anything cool? Any parties or anything? <laughs> Seriously, no? Man, they say, they say UD is a party school, but I'm like, show me. Tell me. <laughs> I've been here almost 10 years. I'm like, I don't know, man. <laughs> Not that it's a bad thing or anything. I'm just saying. <laughs> um, here's the results so far for all rounds with the simulation. Okay. If you're behind, you know we're running short on time. Um, get caught up. Okay. Um, I did some grading last week. I haven't done, I haven't done any grading this week. Um, so... Get caught up, please, so I can uh, record your grades. Okay. And that is all I'm really going to say. I'm going to switch over to my laptop. You got me? Thank you. Good stuff. All right, so tonight we're going to talk about email marketing. Okay, and email marketing is probably one of the more effective ways to market, especially for digital marketers today. Um, it probably return. It probably offers us one of the highest ROIs or return on investment because it's so cheap to market via email. All right, we're talking about like you're probably paying. You're probably paying cents per email that you're sending. Okay, now of course you're gonna pay to, you know, um, design the email or, but chances are you're already getting paid to create the emails that you're sending out, um, you know. Um, but marketing via email, again, is probably one of, the more, one of the more effective ways to market today. So without further ado, let's talk about the objectives is to create an effective strategy for building a commercial email list, create an effective, um, create effective content for a commercial email campaign, excuse me, analyze the results of an email campaign to determine its effectiveness and describe best practices to prevent emails from, from being stopped by spam filters. Right here we have a graph of some email marketing activity and some current trends. And this is from eMarketer.com. So these are actual stats. Um, the, the figures that you're seeing here, it's in billions. All right. So um, there's 28.1 billion emails sent and received per day right here in 2018. All right. The world population, the world population is about, is about 7.6 billion. And that pretty much equates to about 37 emails sent per day per person. All right. Um, here you can see the uh, percentage change. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just looking at my numbers. I mean, my, my notes. All right, so open rates for emails, meaning how often emails are open, 
Um, they hover around 15% for commercial emails. Um, email is still the most preferred method of communication for most people to receive commercial communications. And email marketers often say that email is still king due to the sheer volume of the activity. Okay, that may be an overstatement, but it's still a very powerful marketing channel. Okay, and again, here, these are projected figures. You know, they're saying two, uh, 293.6 billion, billion emails per day. All right, now here's the U.S. digital buyer's preferred channel of receiving brand communications by generation. This is based on July 2016 figures from eMarketer. Um, millennials are people born from 1980 to 1995. So I'm in this category. How many of you in this, are in this category? Millennials. Anyone born after 1995? You're all born after 1995? So you all are Generation Z. Okay, you can see some stats here. You know, uh, millennials, Generation Z, um, pretty pretty close with preferring email. Believe believe it or not, baby boomers, seventy three percent of them prefer email. Um, Generation X, um, which is my wife's generation. Um, 71.0% baby boomers would be like your grandparents. For you folks, um, maybe great grandparents, I'm not sure. And then you can see the rates get smaller. So to people who prefer in-store communication, text messaging, Facebook, digital ads, I find this interesting. It says Generation Z doesn't really like YouTube advertising, but millennials like two point like two point percent of millennials like YouTube, um, Pinterest as well. This doesn't surprise me. Snapchat. I know I personally don't even use it. And here we go. See so Generation Z. Born 1995 to 98, millennials born 1980 to 1995, Generation X 1965 to 1980, baby boomers are 1945 to 1965. All right, now here we have marketing tactics that provide a strong ROI or return on investment, according to in-house marketers worldwide. Here are different years. So 73% ROI for email marketing. You can't ignore emails. 72% for SEL. Okay, we talked about on-site and off-site SEL. And um, you see down here the ROI as well. Um, you see social media in 2017, it was only 44%. Now we're going to talk about email spam versus email marketing. I mentioned this before. There are two, two schools of search engine optimization. One school is black hat. The other school is white hat. Okay. Um, black hat techniques. They obtain an email list, scrape the, scrape the web for emails, okay? They purchase a list, um, and then they send emails about steroids, Viagra, pornography. We all have seen this type of things. White Hat SEO, they obtain an email list, you obtain the email address from your customer, okay? You can do that by um, having an email subscribe form on your website, um, when someone is checking out on your website, you collect their email address. That's a good way to collect it. Um, and then they send emails about product specials, things that are informational and media related emails. 
a white hat technique is also purchasing a list. I'm not quite sure why uh, Stukin didn't decide to put purchase list over here because I've purchased lists before in the past. Um, so, I mean, you can purchase an email list too. Just make sure you're going through a reputable uh, company. Do your research. All right, now catching spam. This graph is to illustrate that some spam filters have really restrictive um, rules or really stringent rules in place that will mark valid email, as you see right here, as spam. That's why that you have that sad face. So, you know, you want to make sure that um, if you have any control of this in the future, you employ an um, email. You, every company should have some type of spam filtering in place because it's just the nature of the beast. People are going to email you junk, okay? Um, but you want you want to make sure that your spam filtering isn't too restrictive because it'll do it'll flag certain emails as what's called false positives, meaning it'll falsely flag something as being positively spammy, okay? Um, and as you can see here, if it's if you send a, a valid email and it's already marked as spam, the people you're sending to, they're not even going to see it. It's going to go right to their email, right to their um, their junk mail or their spam folder. All right. Um, so we're going to move on to spam policing. So your email providers or your ISP or your mailbox providers, they analyze your usage, open rate, whether or not if you hover over an email and um, they report it back. Um, they stop delivering spam email. As you all know, you all, you all have Google emails through the university. And have you ever checked your junk mode, your junk folders? You know, um, Google is scanning your email and identifying things as spam based on different trends. Like if people are opening this email, then it's more than likely not spam. If people are hovering over the email while they're reading it, it's likely not spam. Okay. Then eat then Google, um, tracks those things and, and then, labels spam not spam etc all right um there are spam rep reporting agencies uh, let me see something uh, and um they're looking for pristine emails a pristine spam trap is an email address that was never used by anyone, but is set up by the spam reporting agency to lure, to lure spam emails. And a uh, not pristine spam trap is an email address that used to be valid, but is no longer in use. A spam reporting agency will collect these defunct email addresses to determine which email senders continue to send emails months or years after the email has gone dark. All right. Um, this list underneath um, filters, these are some of the things that can signal um, a spam filter to identify an email message as spam. So if it's in all caps, if it's spammy content, if there's a high image to content ratio, poor HTML coding, and a bunch of exclamation marks. These are the parts of an email. So if you're crafting an email to send out in a marketing campaign, you know, you want to have your subject line, your ad copy, and then unsubscribe. Your subject line should be straightforward and descriptive. You want to avoid selling in your subject line. Your ad copy should be the appropriate format, images versus text. And you should test and link as well before you send out. And you also want to have an unsubscribe link in your emails okay and make sure it's easy to find and you can also collect additional information um, has anyone ever heard of the can spam act okay that's an actual law where it prevents people from sending out masses massive amount of emails okay um, and part of that act says states that if you're sending out a massive email 
especially for marketing uh, marketing purposes, you have to include the unsubscribe link. Okay, that's one of the rules you have to follow. Here's some examples of some good subject lines. After this lecture is over, and before I get into the videos, I'm actually going to show you some emails that come into my web design email account um, as good um, practice, well, so you guys can see what a good email looks like. Um, so here are some good examples of some um, subject lines. Right here, 93% open rate, preliminary floor plans for Southern, for Southern Village neighborhood circle members. All right, in the comment, timely information, imply benefit for quick action, and it has over 50 characters in length. Here's another, your April website stats. It's timely and useful information. Um, let me see if it's something for lower. Here's an obituary. Okay. And again, if you want a copy of these slides, you can get them from Stukent and then you should have a, a, an area that's called um, student resources. You should be able to download the slides from there. If not, just email me and let me know. Here's some poor subject line examples. Final reminder for complimentary entry to attend the West Freelance BCI Cluster Conference 2006. Reminder in the subject is too long. Um, here's, here's another example for the exclamation mark. Looks spammy, you know. Here's another one. Low open rate, 2.5%. Help means ignore. Unfortunately, another help spread the news. Right here is a measure of some bounces, opens and some click throughs different quarters of the year, okay. Um, so if we look at quarter one in 2018, we can see that 1.3% of people in the email list click something in the email, That's the, the unique click rate. Um, and 14.9% had a unique open rate So basically, if you take these two, divide them, you'll get 8.7% of people clicked on something, okay? It's just, these are just like arbitrary metrics to give, give you an idea of what these type of reports would look like here. There's some benchmarks, email uh, marketing benchmarks in North America for quarter one. 2016 and quarter one, 2017. Let me see. The open rate changed. Right here, 2.3% open rate. Total click rate. Decreased a little. The revenues per email, average order value, hard bounce rate, and the uns unsubscribe rate. Again, these benchmarks all come from eMarketer.com. All right, now this shows um, online retail email, an example of two of them. Here's Overstock, and you can see. Overstock has a lot of images because their brand is more like an online store. So they're going to showcase a bunch of images in their email marketing. As opposed to Nordstrom, which is a high-end re re retailer, um, you know, they're going to go for a minimum type style, simple colors, okay, 
the point of this is to demonstrate that your um, emails that you're sending out should also match your main site, okay? Or it should also match the brand. Here's a B2B sales email. Okay, this is for Invivo. It's a pretty popular software for research. This looks pretty vanilla, but it's B2B or business to business, okay? So it doesn't need to be all flashy. Um, but what's really important here, you see there's an unsubscribe link at the bottom. Okay, and then this email, they're just advertising a brown bag webinar, learning how to explore and visualize your data within Vivo. Here's an example of a media email, The Onion, which is a, a um, satirical site. You know, you, no one should be going to The Onion for any type of serious news. You'd be surprised. Some folks, you never know. But Here's an example of an unsubscribe form. Has anyone heard of MailChimp or Constant Contact, Eric, Anthony? Good. Okay. Um, when you create an email campaign in something like MailChimp or Constant Contact, the um, unsubscribe portion is a part of that process. Okay, um, here's an example of an um, unsubscribe form, and then you can tell the person why you wanted to unsubscribe. Okay, here's another unsubscribe option where they'll give you two options. You can do option one, and I'm sure you all have seen this type of uh, form. If not, you will encounter it. Um, you know, you can say, please do not send me summer-related emails. I'm only interested in receiving emails about winter at Whisker Black Home. Or option two, you can say, I, I want to unsubscribe from these uh, specific um, email lists. But he should, there should be like a subscribe from everything option. Okay. All right, now triggered emails. Triggered emails happen basically after, after a certain event. So you can send a triggered email when someone abandons their cart. Okay, meaning a lot of us will go shopping online and we'll add something to the shopping cart only to see how much it costs to ship, right? Because you want to know the total cost. Well, e-commerce sites and retailers know when you abandon the cart, especially if you logged in. So you can send a reminder email, okay, to say, hey, you remember this? You try to purchase it um, a few hours ago, and then maybe you want to offer them a coupon. You might want to be careful of offering them a coupon because people might get hip to the fact that if you abandon the cart, retailer XYZ will send me a coupon. Okay, so you might want to do that um, not as often. You can send a triggered email from in-store purchases. We all have received an email from, um, well, received a receipt via email. Okay, that's, a, that's an email trigger or they can send you different products. Um, this is another good one, past purchases. You can, uh, re retailers are notorious for asking for reviews after the fact, okay? So that's a triggered email. You can ask the uh, customer for a review or you can ask them to provide feedback on their shopping experience. All right, so sending emails to customers who place an item in their online shopping cart but did not complete the transaction is likely the highest ROI internet marketing activity a company can engage in, okay? Just something to consider. You can see this is a bit out of date here. It's from 2013. We don't have an updated slide, but you can see the rates of, you know, the newsletter messages opening and then the triggered email messaging open, opening. OK. 
Okay, so don't give up basically on, on a sale. Um, if you see a lot of people are abandoning the cart, as marketers, you should be figuring out a way to rope those people back in, okay? Because as you see, the proof is in the pudding. Um, triggered emails have a, a large percentage of open rates. All right, now there's a, um, a survey that went out and it was measuring the effective email techniques. And it was the most effective versus difficult email marketing tactic, tactics according to marketers worldwide in February 2018. And red means it was effective, black means it was difficult. So right here, red, we see 46% said single topic email campaigns, effective. 25% said it was difficult. New subscriber welcome emails, 39% said it was effective. Automated event triggered emails, 37%, and so on and so forth. Newsletters with own content, integrated social media campaigns. I find it surprising that, you know, a lot of people don't find like tremendous results off of social media. I mean, it's good results, but it's not as effective as email. So far, that could change. Um, newsletters with curated content and multi-topic email campaigns. <coughs> you see multi-topic email campaigns are pretty difficult, mainly because you should stay on topic with emails. Um, you shouldn't be jumping all around. All right, so onboarding emails. Onboarding emails are like a, a person who, who signs up, a new sign up, okay? Um, less knowledgeable. They haven't been a part of the email list, so they don't know the kind of email content they can expect to receive from the company. More curious, they just barely sign up for the emails, so they anticipate receiving worthwhile content. And they're curious to see what the content will be and more responsive. After people have been a part of the email list for a while, their habits in regards to the emails companies to the company's emails have been established and they will be more difficult to influence. But when they first sign up, their behavior will be more likely to be influenced by the content they see in emails. Um, all these factors imply that the initial emails sent out to new email signups sign are critical in establishing <clears throat> a good email relationship. And that the first few emails should be different than the general broadcast emails sent to the long-time email list members. Okay? This is all about onboarding emails for new people. How many of you subscribe to the skim? You ever hear of the skim? It's a good list, right? All right, these are the type of onboarding emails. Okay? A welcome email, informational, explanatory re-engagement slash next step, promo offers, promo reminders, social invite, friend invite, upsell or exit survey. Here's an example of a welcome email. Hi there. This is from Upscope. I think it's nice that he, she included her picture. There's something that's uh, welcome slash informational. When you see something like where it says, hey, first name, that means the email management software that you're using allows you to um, probably like import an Excel spreadsheet with people's names in it already and it will just fill in their names for you. Okay. Um, you see down here, they have a link in this welcome email, which just encourages further engagement. So they can click on and, and view this, this demo video. There's an informational slash explanatory email. Okay, has nice engaging um, videos here. Watch what Raven Reports can do for you. And more than likely, 
the person viewing this email will click on that and then it will probably go to the video on a website somewhere. But this is pretty engaging because people know, click on this little uh, triangle, sideways triangle means play. Um, here's some um, more informational explanatory emails from Ikea. We're here to help. Assembly, uh, furnishing advice, online planning, just more IKEA examples. You see, they have the unsubscribe link. They also um, include their privacy policy. Here's a re engagement slash next step email. You know, this, this is just a reminder to add photos to your account. Again, that's like a, a triggered email. Here's something that's re engagement slash next step. We noticed that you signed up for Dropbox a while ago, but you never installed the software. And then providing a link to download the software for the people. Another re engagement slash next step email example. See, you notice I have several different links in here. One link's asking for the feedback, the other one's saying add a social network profile. Here's a promo offer. <coughs> right in email, you see this is nice and blue, you see it. Start your free seven day trial. Um, here's a promo offer again slash re engagement. We miss you. 20% off your order. I'm sure we all received those emails. If you haven't shopped online at a certain retailer for a while, they send you a uh, re engagement email. Here's one with a friend invite. You know. Here's something that upsells. So this is an, um, encouraging the person to upgrade to the pro plan. You know, really simple though, right? Really simple email. There's an exit survey example. Okay. Is something wrong? Is there anything we can help with? And as I mentioned before, there are many email service providers. Many are free options. Um, MailChimp, I believe you can have up to 2,000 subscribers for free until they start charging you. Um, and you need to spend money for higher, higher volume, okay? Um, they use what's called a mail transfer agent, and then it allows you to create a database using one of these um, service providers, Constant Contact, Vertical Response, MailChimp, um, and then they'll help you control the speed of which you're sending your emails. If you have a big list of email subscribers, I believe the rule is anything over 500. If you're sending over an email to over 500 people, you should see, you should use something like MailChimp or Constant Contact or anything like that so you don't get flagged, okay? Um, you wanna go through one of these providers, so um, your ISP or UD, the networking people, so they don't flag your accounts, okay? So that's the end of my lecture. I just want to show you all some um, some example emails of what I got in today. So let me see. Like here's one from Box. No travel required. Box Virtual Summit. 
I think that's pretty enticing. They're saying that I can go to this virtual, si virtual summit and I don't have to spend money to go to this actual summit. And then as I open it up, here's the register now button. You know. And there we see unsubscribe, priva privacy policy, etc. Um, here's another one. Let me see. Um, Wilson's Leather. I recently just purchased a new book bag from Wilson's. That's a nice leather book bag. And um, ever since then, they've been blowing my email up. Um, and right here, here's a 50% off site wide for Veterans Day. Really simple, but not a bad deal. So I'm going to mark that as unread because I want to go back to that one. Um, here's another one from Amedia. Delaware Business Times. I really like this newsletter. See, it's nice and clean. All these clickable links. They have advertiser, advertisers in there. And then here we go. Unsubscribe link. You know, you want to do things like include your address. In fact, if you're sending out through MailChimp, you have to provide all that info to comply with Can Spam Act. So yeah, I, I thought it was just important to show you some of that of real life stuff. Um, what you should be looking to do as marketers. So without further ado, I'm going to put the videos on, switch to the desktop. Thank you. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Is our final administrative class like online? It's online. Okay. Yep. Will it like open like today as I think it's open right now. Oh, is it? I think so. Yep. Anyone have any other questions? In the late 1990s and early 2000s, email was growing right alongside the growth of internet usage generally. But spam, or unsolicited email messages, typically from shady enterprises, seemed to be growing at an even faster rate. Because of the low cost of sending email, these enterprises could send thousands of emails with high frequency, thus clogging people's email inboxes. Luckily, since then, spam filters, or software to block these unsolicited messages, have improved tremendously. Partly due to those improvements, people don't necessarily think of emails from commercial enterprises as being spam. In fact, permission-based marketing is some of the highest return activities a company can engage in. Dylan? Yep. I showed you. you. You showed up. Who else showed up? Brian. Brian, that's right. How did it go? Well, well. Did you represent well? Awesome. And who else? Justine. Justine. All right, thank you. Email marketing should always be permission-based. That is to say, you should never send an email to somebody who hasn't given you explicit permission to send them email messages. This in turn means that the first step in email marketing is to collect email addresses along with permission to send email messages to those addresses. This is known as email list capture. First things first, why do we need to gain permission to send emails along with each email address? Why not just send emails out to whatever email addresses we can get our hands on? There are plenty of reasons not to do this, but it's worth mentioning a few. 
First, it's not very effective to send emails to random email accounts. How many spam emails have you received that made you purchase something? Probably not very many. Second, spam filters will eventually find out that you're sending unwanted emails and will block you, which means your already ineffective email campaigns will become even less effective. And third, this is the textbook definition of spam emailing, and spammers are just plain evil, so don't be evil. The first principle of permission-based email marketing is that if people are going to give you permission to email them, they need to know that your emails will give them something they want. Online retailers have it a lot easier than other online businesses in this regard. Every time someone purchases something online, the retailer has the opportunity to earn a new email sign-up. In the checkout process, the retailer can provide a box that allows the purchaser to sign up for emails. Because the person is buying something from the retailer, they're obviously in the mindset that they like what the retailer sells. So they're as likely as they will ever be to let the company send them emails about other good stuff they're selling. As long as the retailer lets the buyer know what kind of valuable information they'll get in the marketing emails, discounts, free shipping, new merchandise, etc., they're likely to get a good share of buyers signing up for emails. Okay, so that's nice for online retailers. What about everyone else? The principle remains the same, that for people to sign up for emails, they have to know they're getting something of value from them. In the business-to-business -business world, content that helps people do their job better is gold. Consider Tableau, a data analysis software that is becoming very useful to companies in this era of big data. If you go to their website, you see lots of content to help in education and training about using Tableau. If you click on one of their white papers, you'll see an email sign-up form. To download the white paper, you have to fill out the email form. The user gets some valuable information in the white paper, and Tableau will engage in lead nurturing. That is, Tableau will send periodic emails to this lead in the hopes that the information in the email will nurture the desire of this lead to purchase Tableau or to have his company purchase Tableau. In addition to white papers, Tableau also offers webinars or online trainings, and entrance into these trainings requires a sign-up for their email list. This is standard procedure for business-to-business -business companies. A company has valuable knowledge and skills, and if the company can share that knowledge in a white paper or webinar, this is a good enticement for people to give the company their email address. Other ideas for enticing people to sign up for an email list are contests or giveaways. If entry into the contest is contingent on signing up for email, a company can collect lots of emails in a short period. Offline retailers often collect email addresses at the point of sale. It becomes a standard step in the checkout procedure. Trade shows or events are common in the corporate world and attendees at these events might be interested in keeping up to date with a company via email. In the marketing emails that get sent out, a company can provide a link to enable them to share the email with a friend. Even better, if a company lets people from their email list forward a coupon to a friend via email, this could induce a sale and a new member of the email list. Creative minds will probably be able to come up with lots of other techniques. The key is to let people know the benefits of signing up for emails. A final consideration in collecting email signups is the nature of the email capture form. When collecting email addresses, the form can have as few as one entry box, or as many as a dozen or more. If a company uses a one-box email capture form like the one you see here, the company will get a lot of emails. It doesn't get any easier to sign up for an email list than simply inputting your email address once. But the company sacrifices the ability to learn more about the people on their list. This limits the company's ability to send email tailored to a particular segment of the list. If it's a fashion company, it would probably want to know the sex of each member of the list so it can send emails about men's clothing to men and emails about women's clothing to women. If it's a business-to-business -business software company, it might want to send different emails to people who work in sales versus those who work in IT. On the other hand, if the company uses an extensive email capture form like this one, the company can learn a lot about the members of the email list and send better content that is tailored to different segments of the list. Don't forget on your group projects, your group final project, you need a form, okay? 
However, they will gather fewer emails because only the very interested and motivated will fill out such a large form. So which is better, the long form or the short form email capture? As you might have guessed, there's no right answer for all companies. But the broad guideline is, make the form as short as possible, but not shorter. What is meant by that is that you don't want to collect any information that's not necessary or useful because every additional length in the form causes people to be less likely to sign up. So gather the necessary information, but that's it. Another important practice in signing people up for your email list is to use double opt-in rather than single opt-in. If you use single opt-in, you just start emailing people as soon as they sign up. With double opt-in, you send them an opt-in email to verify that they want to begin receiving marketing emails. They have to verify this by clicking on a link in that email. The reason double opt-in is recommended is that it's another way to make sure that everyone on your marketing email list actually wants to receive your emails and won't mark you as spam. A few years back, out of the blue, I started receiving a barrage of emails from a local car dealership trying to get me to make an appointment for a test drive and to sell them my car so I would buy a car from the dealership and all sorts of very intrusive emails. What I think happened was that someone entered my email address to the car dealership's email promotion system and because they were using single opt-in, I immediately started receiving all of their intrusive emails that I didn't want. If they had been using double opt-in, I would have ignored their verification email and not received all of those annoying emails. Once you've captured a list of email addresses, along with permission to send email marketing messages to those emails, you need to determine the content of the emails you'll be sending as well as the frequency with which you'll be sending those email marketing messages. The content of your emails will depend heavily on the kind of website you run, but it will also depend on the kind of email you're sending. Broadcast email messages or marketing messages sent out to the entire email list are only one kind of email marketing message. You may also want to send onboarding emails, transactional emails, and triggered emails. Broadcast emails are the main marketing emails going out to all or part of your email list. The optimal design, format, and content of these emails depend on a number of factors, including the business model of the company sending the emails. For an online retailer, the purpose of emails is to entice customers to purchase more from the company. This in turn means that broadcast emails from an online retailer should feature enticing products. Depending on the nature of the retailer, these emails might regularly feature some sort of discount or promotion. Overstock.com is all about the deep discounts, so their broadcast emails almost always feature a variety of discounts on various products. Nordstrom, on the other hand, is all about high-end products, and their clientele is less centrally concerned about price, so emails from Nordstrom are usually focused on new product lines rather than on discounts. Nordstrom customers value knowing about new fashions, so those emails are valuable to its users. Overstock customers want great deals, so those emails are valuable to its users. The important thing is to create email content that is valuable to users so they stay on the email list and look at the content of the email and purchase something new as a result. Online search engines like Expedia and Orbitz send broadcast emails in the hopes of getting users to book a trip because the search engine gets a commission on each one of these trips. The vacation industry is extremely cutthroat with deep discounts being constantly offered on excess capacity. So any travel search engine has access to myriad discounted vacation packages. This means that they have a lot of content to choose from when sending out broadcast emails. They can fill up emails with news of discounts on all varieties from flights to hotels to cruises to car rentals. Media companies also have an easy time creating email content. Media websites make money every time someone looks at their website because the user will be exposed to advertising that the website gets paid for. So what should be the content of their emails? Easy, just the new media content. A weekly magazine like The New Yorker could send an email about the content of each magazine as it comes out. But it can also be smarter about it. 
By sending out daily emails of a smaller portion of the weekly issue, it creates additional opportunities to entice website visits and hence make extra money. It also frequently features some older content rather than exclusively the content from the current issue. This has the dual benefit of making money from content that otherwise would be dead and keeping the incentive for people to pay money for the new content. If users could find all the new content on their email, they would have less incentive to pay for the subscription. Regular broadcast emails can also be very useful and profitable for lead generation websites, but the nature of the content of these emails differs dramatically depending on the kind of lead the company is dealing with. For a B2B services company like IBM, Adobe, or Oracle, the purpose of broadcast emails is usually lead nurturing. That is, these companies sell enterprise solutions, meaning their software or services get purchased through a long purchase cycle, entailing lots of decision makers at various levels of the company and through a negotiated agreement as to the extent of the services provided and the price of said services. The purpose of the broadcast emails is to nurture leads. Continue to convince the potential client that the company is best in class at the services they provide and can help the potential client perform better in their own business. This helps grease the wheels of a future deal. Content of these lead nurturing emails is usually case studies, white papers, and other content featuring the superior performance of the company's services or products. Lead nurturing works very differently for other types of lead generation websites. A real estate agent may send weekly broadcast emails about new houses on the market or about tips for increasing home value. The purpose of these emails is to keep her name top of mind for when potential clients decide to buy or sell a house. In the case of a smaller lead generation website, creating good email content tends to be constrained by the quantity of possible content. If the agent is writing weekly emails, she has to come up with content to fill 52 emails per year. That's very difficult for a small operation. Broadcast emails for lead generation websites can be a very good idea, but they can also be quite burdensome, so a small outfit needs to be sure it's ready for the commitment. Something that should be obvious to you but needs to be reiterated nonetheless is the fact that an email marketing team needs to work closely with the web team to make sure landing pages are well designed and correspond well with the email content. A broadcast email might contain a dozen different clickable parts and each one of those parts needs to have a different landing page. It makes no sense to have one portion of the email advertise 30% off sweaters if clicking on that portion of the email takes them to the website's home page. Even if the click takes them to a sweaters page, if the messaging on that landing page doesn't prominently feature the 30% off that was advertised in the email, then the landing page is still not delivering what the customer needs. So designing good landing pages is a necessary input to good email marketing. Two important issues regarding broadcast emails need to be addressed. First, how often should the company send out emails? And second, should it send the same email to everyone on the email list or segment the list somehow? As far as the question on frequency of emails, the answer, of course, is it depends. But beyond that obvious answer, the less obvious and more useful answer is that emails should go out as frequently as you can create quality content for the emails. This goes counter to what most people would think instinctively. You're probably thinking about the fact that as a customer, it's annoying to get too many emails from a company. So to avoid annoying customers, you should send at most one email per week. Well, that thinking is wrong because sending emails is basically printing money. Every email you send induces purchases or money generating website visits. So the more emails you send, the more money you make. So you want to send as many emails as you can as long as you can keep the quality and variety of the emails high. That's why a company like Overstock, with millions of products to sell, sends more than seven emails per week. It has plenty of content to feature in its emails, and every email makes it money. So it sends out emails at breakneck speeds. But if you think about that real estate agent, sending one email per week is daunting since coming up with new content is difficult for a one-person operation. She still wants to send as many emails as she can, but since she can only create high-quality content for one email per week or one email every two weeks, she should stick to this lower pace.
Now on to the second question. Should everyone on the email list receive the same email? The answer to this question is easy, not if you can help it. You have lots of different people on your email list and those different people have different preferences, meaning there's different content that appeals to each one of them. As much as possible, you should target people on your list with content that appeals to them. But of course, this assumes you know what appeals to some people and what appeals to others. You probably don't know this information in any great detail. That's the first major barrier in giving people targeted content. You don't know what appeals to them in particular. The second major barrier is that even if you do know what content uniquely appeals to different segments of your list, you have to manage your email database in a way that lets you act on this knowledge. That is, you have to set up your email database to let you select different members of the list. And finally, a third major barrier is that by segmenting your email list, you have to create more content. You have to create different content for different segments so your workload multiplies. First things first, you can engage in email targeting in two broad ways. One way is to send emails only to select segments. Let's say you own an online clothing store and you get a shipment of scarves for the new season that you want to promote. If you have a way of knowing which segment of your list is likely to be interested in these new scarves, you could send an email about the scarves to just those people on the list. A second way to engage in email targeting is to carve out sections of an email to be different depending on segment membership. Let's say that instead of sending an email about the scarves, you're going to send an email about a fall sale on different clothing lines. In one portion of the email, you could feature the new scarves, but you could also feature new hats. If you knew which segment of your email list liked scarves and which preferred hats, you could send the same email to everyone on the list, but change this portion of the email depending on which segment they are in. Either method of targeting or segmenting is available. So how do we go about conducting this segmentation? How do we find out about what people like? Our first and most powerful evidence comes from purchase behavior. Whatever product someone has purchased in the past gives you a very strong indication of what they're interested in. Past email response is another piece of evidence to consider. If someone opens and clicks on emails that feature men's clothing but not emails that feature women's clothing, then this is a strong indication of this person's interests. Which brings us to demographics. Demographics like age and gender might be an indication of interests, but don't put too much faith in demographics. Men and women buy gifts, so it might not make sense to prevent women from seeing men's products or vice versa. Aside from broadcast emails, three other types of emails sent by companies to its customers or potential customers are onboarding emails, transactional emails, and triggered emails. In email marketing, you want to strike while the iron's hot, so to speak. As soon as someone signs up for email messages from you, they are as primed and ready as they will ever be to pay attention to your email messages. So these first few emails should be the best of the best, both to get them to convert and to get them in the mindset of checking your emails. Examples of good onboarding emails are a special welcome offer, like a large discount on a popular item, invitations to connect on social media, invitations to download the mobile app, invitation to refer friends in exchange for additional discounts, a reminder about the welcome offer if they didn't redeem it on the first time, and maybe an explanation of website features. Once a recipient has received these onboarding emails, he or she is then added to the regular rotation of broadcast emails. If the onboarding emails have done the trick, the recipient will be more likely to open the regular broadcast emails and click on the content. Transactional emails are emails sent as a direct result of a purchase or a transaction, hence the name. As soon as you make a purchase on Amazon, for example, you receive an automated email letting you know that your order has been received. Soon thereafter, you'll receive another email letting you know that your order has shipped. Depending on what you bought, you might then receive another email letting you know your order was delivered. None of those emails was part of the usual set of broadcast emails. And what's important about transactional emails is that a retailer does not need permission from people to send these emails. It's understood that email is the primary method of communication between a buyer and seller online. The standard rules also state 
that the subject line and the primary content of the email has to be focused on the transactional information. But that doesn't mean a seller can't include other promotional content in the email. As long as the primary content, meaning the content at the top of the email, provides information about the transaction, the retailer can include promotional content, like information about related products or a call to action to sign up for email or for Amazon Prime, for example. Because this person has just purchased something from the retailer, this person quite likely will be willing to purchase something more, so it makes sense to promote something in these transactional emails. Just be sure to place the promotional material below the transactional information and make sure the subject line has only transactional information in it. Finally, we have triggered emails. Triggered emails get sent to people because those people took some action that triggered an email. The most common and most profitable triggered email is the abandoned cart email. If you're shopping on Amazon and you put a product in your cart, but for whatever reason you don't actually purchase the product, within 24 hours you'll probably receive an email from Amazon reminding you that you have unpurchased products in your shopping cart. Amazon has set up this triggered email. In basic terms, Amazon has set up a program to check for people who have added a product to their online shopping cart but did not purchase the item. When the program sees this behavior, it triggers an email to be sent to the user who added the product. These emails are incredibly profitable because the conversion rate is extremely high. If the person added the product to her shopping cart, it's because she's interested in buying it. She might have just gotten distracted, or maybe she decided to wait for a while to make sure she really wanted to purchase it. A reminder email might be all she needed to get her back to finish the purchase. Or maybe an added discount of 10% in the triggered email would push her over the edge and get her to make the purchase. If you ever happen to be working at an online retailer and you find out that the retailer doesn't have an abandoned cart email program set up, ask to be put in charge of this email program. Set up this email program and watch the money roll in. You will be the star employee in short order. Of course, abandoned cart emails are not the only type of triggered email. As a retailer with an email list, you have full control over what actions you want to have trigger an email. When someone buys something from your site, your email system should automatically send a series of transactional emails, but you could also set up a trigger to send an email to review the product they purchased or to provide recommendations of add-on products. If you're smart about it, you'll set up the timing of the trigger to match the product type. If someone purchases new bed sheets, you should trigger the product review email a week or two after product delivery. But if someone purchases a new mattress, you should wait a month or two to give them time to set up the mattress and get used to it before asking them to review it. You could also set up a trigger to give a deep discount to members of the email list who haven't opened or clicked on an email in a long time. The list of possible triggers goes on. Any behavior that indicates that an email of a particular kind will help the customer make a purchase or interact in a positive way with your company is a good trigger. You learned in the section on web analytics that you can dramatically improve the performance of your website if you track the behavior of your website users and make changes to your website to encourage those users to take more profitable action. So it should come as no surprise that you should also track the performance of your emails and make changes to improve upon the profitability of your email marketing efforts. The first important statistic you want to monitor on all emails is the open rate. Your emails don't do any good if nobody sees them. You want to keep your open rate as high as possible, primarily by writing good subject lines that very concisely and accurately describe the content of the email. Your email open rate also gives you a good idea if there are technical problems with your emails. If your open rate suddenly drops for an email, this could be an indication that your emails have been caught by a spam filter and you need to review why this is the case. Once someone opens your email, you want them to click on something to get to your website. 
So click-through rate should also be measured and monitored for two related reasons. First, it tells you what content is more appealing to the members of your email list. Second, it tells you what content is more appealing to particular members of your email list. By recording what content was clicked on by what members, you can see what specific types of content appeal to that particular person. This data can be the basis for segmenting your email list. Of course, once an email recipient arrives at the website, we need them to convert. So conversion rate should also be tracked. If the conversion rate on your emails is not higher than the conversion rate from other traffic, you're doing something wrong. Your email list is composed mostly of your most loyal customers or most interested potential customers. And this loyalty should manifest in a higher conversion rate than typical search traffic or referral traffic. But while we're measuring conversion rate, don't forget about average order value. If Overstock sends an email featuring scarves and another email featuring couches, the conversion rate is almost guaranteed to be higher for the scarves. But couches have a much higher order value, so the higher conversion rate on the scarves email doesn't by itself indicate that it was better. Overstock needs to measure conversion rate and average order value together to determine which email netted more profit for the company. Those four metrics are important for monitoring the results of each broadcast email. An important metric for monitoring your email members is churn. Churn rate is the percentage of customers that unsubscribe from the email list. As an email marketer, you need to get used to the idea that every email you send is also a reminder to users that they might want to unsubscribe. Every single email that gets sent out will result in some people unsubscribing. This is normal, so you shouldn't panic or think you're doing something wrong when you get unsubscribe requests. But that said, you also want to keep this number, the churn rate, as low as possible. Anything that increases the churn rate, whether it be certain types of email content or certain formatting of the email content, should be adjusted. This is the last uh, video right here. No matter how skilled and creative your email marketing efforts, they won't profit you anything if your emails get caught by spam filters. So everything you do in email marketing should be done with those spam filters in mind. We're going to discuss best practices to make sure your emails get delivered to the email inbox and not to the spam filter, or worse yet, blocked before they even arrive at the email address. We already mentioned one important aspect of avoiding the spam filter, double opt-in. You should always use double opt-in when obtaining new email signups. As long as you've instituted that practice, you're more than halfway down the road to safety from spam filter purgatory. Another important technique to prevent your emails from getting caught in spam filters is to keep your email list clean. You should be proactive in removing these three types of email addresses from your list. One, hard bounces. A hard bounce occurs when the server couldn't find the email address to deliver it to, which means the email address was fake. Obviously, there's no upside to keeping these email addresses on file, so delete these immediately. Most email services like MailChimp and Constant Contact will delete these email addresses automatically. Second, five soft bounces in a row. Soft bounces usually occur when someone's email inbox is full, or when the email server is down temporarily. It's hard to believe that in this day of nearly unlimited email inbox size from Gmail, people can still have a full inbox, but it does happen. There's no need to remove soft bounces right away, but if an email address gets five soft bounces in a row, best remove them. Finally, you should remove email addresses that have not opened a single email for several months. First, since they're not acting on your emails, they're not doing you any good. But more important than that, if you keep sending emails for too long, spam filters might see that you're not actively managing your email list and might start blocking you. Email spammers never clean up their email lists, so companies that don't clean up their email lists start to look like spammers. That's a perception you don't want to perpetuate, so keep your email list clean. Finally, make sure that every broadcast email includes an unsubscribe button. You don't have to make this prominent or feature a call to action to it, of course, 
because it's not the action you want people to take. But it needs to be easy to find, and your database should be set up to act on the unsubscribe request immediately. If you've ever unsubscribed from an email list, you might have seen the resulting message to give 7 to 10 days for the unsubscribe request to take effect. I think that in this age of automation, if you can't make the unsubscribe requests take effect immediately, you have no business being entrusted to do email marketing. So make sure your unsubscribe requests are set up to work immediately. And make it easy for users to unsubscribe. Don't make people input their email address to unsubscribe. They just clicked on an email from their email address. So you know what their email is. Just unsubscribe them. If you make them input their email address, they might decide it's easier to mark you as spam, which quickly puts you on the short list for spam filter purgatory. But also keep in mind, the unsubscribe request is one last chance to keep people on your email list. When someone clicks on the unsubscribe link, they should be taken to a landing page that lets them choose to reduce their email subscription instead of being removed from it entirely. Of course, being removed from the email list should be an easy to find option on the list, but you should give them a chance to receive emails once a week or to only receive emails about specific product categories. That way, they stay on your email list and you learn more about what kind of products this recipient is interested in. All right, does anyone have any questions? All right, see you next week.